Friends, will you pray with me? And as you feel so comfortable, I invite you to join in the second time through. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God. Amen. Apologies to Carol for skipping over you. <laughs> Sue and I being prepared to serve yesterday, we were gone for 11 hours. Sue picked me up at 7.15 in the morning and dropped me back off at 6 o'clock. So, uh, so apologies if we're both a little foggy today. But here we have arrived at the first Sunday of our Lenten journey, preparing ourselves for Easter and this Lent, uh, we are journeying together uh, through creation and talking and thinking about creation care. Uh, we'll be following that devotional, uh, the For the Beauty of the Earth, um, which uh, she has broken down into different parts of creation per, for each week. And so uh, I'll be sort of following her in uh, each Sunday's sermon. And this Sunday... We are focused on soil and land. And now, many people may think of soil and land and dirt as not very interesting. And going, looking at the scripture from Matthew where Jesus is out in the wilderness fasting and is tempted, I think often we are, as the sermon title says, tempted to possess. Are certainly our ancestors arriving on the shores of this land were beyond more than tempted uh, to possess, but took it upon themselves to say, it is mine, it is ours now, and started making lines around things, lines that had previously not been there, divided, we see rock walls in this area of the country, that divided property from property, this is mine, not yours. And then from that idea of possession, we then start to treat the land and the soil as objects, as a thing, a thing to possess, a thing to use for our benefit and try to get out as much as possible. And I think our ancestors sort of trying to get away, and I'm talking ancestors going back generation upon generation, trying to separate ourselves from the pagans and the worship of the earth really, try, really ended up separating themselves from the earth and from creation and forgetting that the soil, too, is part of something that God created. That in one of the creation stories, and this is where we get our Ash Wednesday practice, we say, you have come from dust, and to dust you shall return. We remember that creation story where God formed the first humans out of dirt, clay, soil, and then breathed life. We remember that on Ash Wednesday and pretty much forget it the rest of the year. But we are part of the soil, and the soil is part of us. And the health of soil is directly related to our health. And like everything else, our relationship to land, to the earth, to soil, really should be a lot more relational. We should be seeing the soil as a subject to be in relationship with rather than an object to possess and use. Healthy, good soil, and I think of, I listen to a podcast called The Good Dirt, and so I think of good dirt. They ask each 
eat everybody, on the, every guest, what does the good dirt mean? So I think of this, good dirt. In one teaspoon of good dirt, they say, are more organisms than there are people on earth. One teaspoon. And that is good, healthy soil. That is not soil that has been planted year after year with one type of crop, as we often have, sort of, if you imagine the giant farms of the Midwest, say, with soy or corn, depleting nutrients and having to put artificial nutrients back in to actually be able to grow, but real good soil. When we have this relationship with soil, when we treat soil as something sacred, not to be worshipped, but a sibling in God's creation, it transforms our relationship. Now, I was really hoping maybe to have a scoop of soil, but the weather <clears throat> sort of changed and shifted, and all our soil is buried and getting more buried at, by the minute <laughs> under more snow. But under that, so under that snow, we know there is good dirt under there. And dirt is so particular to place. It's one of the most interesting things. Even You can't even say New England soil or New Hampshire soil or Monadnock region soil because it is so particular. The soil that I have here in Hancock is very different than the soil we had in Bennington, five miles away. Completely different. And even really, the soil in one spot on our property is different from soil on a different spot on our property. But it is alive. It is alive with organisms that work together to help bring life, to help nurture animals and plants and humans. It is good dirt and good soil that allows us to grow food. One of the core parts of the Bible. You know, we so often focus on that one line in Genesis about subduing and dominion that God you know put us in the garden and is like here here's the earth for you to have dominion over subdue it and we say see that's what we're that's what our role is and we forget all the other parts of the Bible that talk about growth and nurture and the plants we look at Jesus's teachings and we Forget, though, that Jesus was talking to an agrarian society. These are people who were a deep relationship with the soil around them. That Jesus spoke in metaphors of farming, about seeds falling on soil, about grapes and vines. When they're talking about bread, it is not bread in a wrapper, pre-sliced in perfect little pieces, it is bread that they have made out of a plant that somebody they know grew, and there's a deep connection there to the soil and the land. Now, obviously, I don't think we can go at this point in our society and go back and say, okay, well, we're all just going to communally live on this land. The lines are drawn. And they're there. And we live in a society where you have your little how many acres and your little... Now, and still, though, what I love if in living in this part of the country is that if you go and you look at your deed, you still will very much have descriptions like walk ten paces to the part of the stone wall and the apple tree that's, you know, things that don't actually exist anymore. But those lines are there nonetheless. But I think that we can still shift our relationship to land. To see the land on which we live and work and worship, not as something we possess, but as a partner, a neighbor, 
And how are we to treat neighbors? But to treat them as we would treat ourselves, to care for them, to nurture them, to work to make sure they are treated justly and have the things they need to be healthy. And I hope and I encourage you, once we get past this white covering on our soil, whenever that might be, the uncertainty of a New England winter, that you will go out and you will step on the earth with some bare feet, if you can find a spot. Uh, there is um, a practice, they call it either earthing or grounding, that connects us. There is some evidence, uh, scientific evidence, as well as anecdotal evidence, that that connecting our bare skin to the dirt and to the soil and to the earth and land actually changes us physically. That there is energy there. There is a transfer of energy. We not, may not be able to go and have a conversation with the dirt or the worms in the dirt or the organisms and the fungi in the dirt, although they are talking to each other. But we can have a transfer of energy. We can scoop up the earth and honor it as something that reflects the divine in a way. We can touch it, feel it. If you really want to go a little woo, you can, might ask it what it needs, how it's feeling. Again, I wouldn't expect words to come back, and if they do, you maybe have come have a conversation with me and we can talk about that. But you might just listen. Notice, do you see anything crawling through your dirt? And if not, well, that earth might be telling you it needs something because there should be things crawling through your dirt. If there is patchy grass or patchy anything, well, maybe it needs something. What does it need? How can you nurture it? The more we know, and this is true in any relationship, right? The more we get to know someone, the more understanding grows and the more invested we become in that person's or soil's or whatever's well-being. So get to know your dirt and your soil. Look through the Bible and find those stories where earth is so central because there's a lot of places where the earth gets cracked and dried and doesn't bring life and the people of God struggle. Where Jesus goes out and sits on a mountain, touching the earth, connecting to that. I hope that in this journey of Lent, as we get to know and consider all these different parts of creation, that we will then grow closer to creation. Have an, take initiative to learn more about it, about what makes it healthy and happy, not just because it will benefit us, though it will, but because it is how God would have us be in relationship. Not us separate from creation, which is something else, but remembering that we are creation as well. And we are part of the soil and the land and the dirt as it is part of us. We are dust. We come from dust. And someday, 
to dust we will return. Amen.